part two with Ramsey Dewey. Uh, part one went awesome, so yeah. I'm excited for this one. <laughs> yeah, good to talk to you again, Mark. How you doing, man? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. How are you? I guess. Oh, hold on. Let me good, good. All things considered, just uh, um, man, we're on month three of the quarantine here in Shanghai. Mm. For all this uh, this viral outbreak situation, we had a bit of a chat about that before the podcast. So probably don't need to rehash that, but three months, man, and the gyms are the gyms are just starting to reopen very slowly here in Shanghai. That's that's exciting. Hopefully, that gives hope to those out there in the rest of the world that they won't be stuck indoors forever and ever. There was actually a couple of things yeah. uh, regarding the virus. Um, so some people actually yeah. believe that. Uh, I, I personally don't believe this, obviously, for very obvious reasons, but some people... Are, are we talking conspiracy theories? Yes, definitely Throw them at me, man. Theories. Throw them at me. <laughs> um, some people <laughs> were talking about how they don't know anybody. People, like, anybody doesn't know anybody who's infected, and they think it's all just one big, like, uh, just one big scare mm. thing. But I'm assuming, especially in, like, the bigger Interesting. Places, that you would know somebody who, like, has uh, the virus or, like, knows somebody who has the virus, right? Uh, that's that's an interesting point, because hmm, personally, and I hate to throw fuel on the fire of conspiracy yeah. theories, I don't personally know anyone <laughs> who has it. Yeah. But at the same time, like everybody in Shanghai, everybody in every major city in China, the world's most populated country, which is just staggering to think about, has been staying indoors for like the last three months, mm -hmm. which is... A phenomenal achievement of human engineering, basically. That's probably not even the right word. Human shepherding, if you will. <laughs> I don't even know how that's possible, but yeah. everybody's been staying inside, so... Man, probably the the only people who have had first-hand experience with this are those who actually have it, who were probably quarantined by themselves or in hospitals or whatever, and medical professionals. So, man, it's like that... Like that idea, you never see Superman and Clark Kent at the same time. Yeah, yeah. So, coincidence? They, <laughs> I don't know, man. I don't know. What, but, what else yeah. you got? What other uh, theories have you been hearing? It's not necessarily. This other one isn't necessarily a conspiracy theory. It's just crazy. Um, so, in China, for example, everything will be shut down completely for, it was three months, you said. Um, here, it's more of like the social three months. distancing. Yeah. So, people aren't like... They're yeah, I've been hearing that word a yeah. lot on the web. Yeah, people just recommend... Well, like, what exactly is that? Social... Social distancing? What so... is the social distancing exactly? So Because I, uh, I didn't get the whole PSA over here in the... It's it's really... I don't think it's as effective. So it's basically if just recommending people to not go out. And if you do go out, you keep uh, a distance of 6 to 10 feet. Just because like, if you sneeze or cough or whatever, that's like how far the... Uh. Uh, but regardless not everybody since it's not like mandatory some people aren't taking it as seriously so you'll go out people are like still going to parties and stuff and you're just going out to buy essentials oh, nobody's wow. wearing masks it's actually kind of crazy so uh when when stuff like that happens and especially like gyms are closing down but uh there's like one gym for example which is open and i didn't know this but i see this on my uh my friend's instagram and then everybody's commenting like yo where is this i want to go to this so it's uh it's not unless oh, wow. it's like mandatory i feel like it's just gonna screw like a lot of people over and all you really need is like that one person to infect yeah, 10 people and those 10 people to infect a thousand people and so on so yeah exactly i mean it is as far as i understand it man this is super contagious it's like you breathe on somebody you can pass it on it's mm. uh it is that big of a deal so man in America, though, man, you you can't take away people's freedom, man, because yeah. that's that's all that's what makes it America, that's right? You can't true, tell yeah. them stay inside or else. I mean, you can suggest it, you can strongly suggest it, but you can't make them do it. Mm. And that's uh, yeah, that's one of the big differences in China. They actually can make you do it. Yeah. Like the government has that power, which it's a scary power to think of, but you know, on the bright side, on the bright side, it's keeping people alive on the side of the world. So, and it's not. It's man, I actually did a pod. Yeah. Uh, I, I was just saying they don't like yeah. they don't abuse the power too much. They're doing it for a good reason. I feel like so. 
Yeah, so the social distancing, that's kind of like that thing people in America naturally do at movie theaters where they leave a few spaces mm. between them because yeah. it's just awkward to sit next to other people. It's totally opposite here in yes. China, man. They have assigned seats in movie theaters, <laughs> which is weird because, you know, I'm, I was so used to, you know, the American natural social distancing in the movie theater. You, yeah. you leave a few seats in between. But they sell out, like, every theater seat oh, wow. on, on a regular yeah. basis in China because there's just so many people. Mm. And so they assign your seats. You sit in B12, and you sit next to a stranger right next to them, and it's, it's just normal because... That's how it is. It's so many people in close proximity to each other, which is why, you know, a virus like this is so incredibly frightening in cities of this magnitude, like yeah. 27 million people. Actually, more if you include, like, um, undocumented immigrants and whatnot. But 27 million official population. And, like, the metro, the subway here, it's, it's like sardines. Like, people just literally squished up against each other. So, again, the idea of a, of a viral contagion spread through breath i mean that's that's the stuff of nightmares man yeah have so, you seen uh there's uh but on sorry? the what were you on the bright side on the bright side hopefully on the bright side hopefully we're we seem to be reaching the tail end of it here in in shanghai at least yeah it seems like it there's like no i think last time i checked it was uh zero literally zero infected in uh in 24 hours which is very very impressive for china it's a huge city or a huge uh, area so but yeah. have you seen uh there's yeah, two movies there's contagion or uh outbreak i believe it's called have you seen either of those i i think so my my wife is a huge fan of movies about infectious disease and zombie apocalypses and that sort of thing she she just loves them and yeah. has me watch every single one of them with her so i'm not sure which one it was it was one of those disease movies right absolutely yeah, it's definitely a disease movie <laughs> um but yeah. i'll tell you i'll tell you what this I'll tell you what this uh, Corona apocalypse actually reminds me of movies wise. Bird Box. You ever seen that one? Mm, is that the one? The Sandra with the, Bullock movie. The, the bandana. Yes, thing they right wear now. they oh, wear I've, blindfolds. I haven't seen it, but I've heard so much yeah. about it. Okay, I'm gonna give you some spoilers okay. for Bird Box. Well, a plot synopsis basically. So there's this I don't know, some kind of monster. They never show it. They never show it. But if you look at it, it drives you crazy and makes you go kill yourself. Mm. Except for people who are already crazy, then it gives them glowing green eyes and they go around killing other people. Mm. And so when people figure out there's this invisible monster out there, if you look at it, you die, basically. They hide inside. And if they go outside, they wear a mask. And the more I think about it, the more I realize that's exactly like what's going on here. There's an invisible monster oh, outside. Yeah. If we go out, we have to wear a mask, a different type of mask. And... There are some crazy people out there who have this, and they might not even realize it, and they're spreading it. It's Bird Box. <laughs> anyway, Bird Box with uh, hopefully a more satisfying conclusion, because that, that movie had a strange ending. Oh, no, what happened? <laughs> oh, you want, you want me to spoil oh, yeah, the whole thing? Ahead, oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. So the protagonists of the movie, they are trying to escape, and, and they, they get on the radio, they get a message from this refuge. They're like, come here, we'll, we'll, we'll all live in safety together and sing Kumbaya, it's, it's going to be great. And so they follow the, the radio, they finally get to this place, and it turns out to be a school for the blind. And they're, they're safe because they can't see the monsters in the first place. Uh -huh. And I'm thinking, okay, that's, it's cute how they play it up, but... How does that solve the problem? Because the people who aren't blind, who came to the school of the blind, can still see the monsters and go crazy and start killing. So that doesn't solve the problem. Yeah. Anyway, full of plot holes, but so is real life too, right? It sounds like a good movie, actually. Uh, I heard it was very emotional too, so <laughs> I was very uh, hesitant on watching it. Yeah. <laughs> you, you might like it. It got, it got a lot of mixed reviews. Some people loved it. Some people hated it. But it inspired so many internet memes, man. So many <laughs> internet memes. And I saw the memes before I saw the movie. I'm like, what, is, what do these memes mean? I have to see the movie now. So I watched the movie, and throughout the movie, I found myself laughing. Like, that's what the meme means. <laughs> and it's supposed to be a serious part. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds like it's going to be me. That's why I didn't go to so, the movie. So, yeah, theater. man. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be that one guy who's laughing. Everybody <laughs> else is crying. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. 
Oh, man. I've, I've had that experience more than once <laughs> watching movies with my brother, man. It's how we are. We're weird like yeah. that. <laughs> yeah, and Contagion at this point is basically like a documentary. Uh, the disease that happened in that movie it uh, started in China. I think it, the only difference, if I remember correctly, I think it was uh, uh, – they said it was from – I think it was actually a wet market as well. I mean, I guess it's not like guaranteed, I guess. Some people actually, this is another conspiracy yeah. theory now. <laughs> Some people are talking okay, about yeah, yeah. Uh, how it could be like a, a bioweapon, which is why nobody really like, uh, what's it called? Nobody really like talked about it at first until like it became like really serious. Now, I don't know if I believe this, obviously, because, like, I, in my opinion, if they, if right. anybody wanted to make a bioweapon, I feel like it would have been way worse. But, I mean, you never know. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. There are, there are so many ways to kill people. It's ridiculous. Yeah. But, man. Uh, an infectious virus that gives some people pneumonia, gives other people mild cold-like symptoms straight up kills other people and seems to have almost no effect on some mm. probably not the best bioweapon but exactly, man it is yeah. uh, definitely obnoxious yeah if uh, but yeah. that uh, that is interesting what what's going on over here in china is kind of strange because how can i put this oh so I have a friend who is um, Chinese-American, and she's over in the U.S. right now, and she experienced some, some racism, mm. if you will, some, some negative things, some mean things were said to her because she looks Chinese, like this is all your fault, basically. And she communicated back over here to some friends in China saying, if the roles were reversed, this would never happen, except the roles totally are reversed over here in China. And the blame has now been cast on the foreigners, mm. <laughs> which is something that might sound absolutely absurd because everybody knows like it started over there in Wuhan, right? Yeah. Except here's what happened. So when the news of the viral outbreak happened, a bunch of the foreigners were like, we're gone. We're out of here. We'll come back when this whole thing blows over. And uh, so they come back and everybody's saying they're bringing the disease back with them. So oh, yeah. now what's happening, if, if you go out, if you go to like stores, if you go to public places, uh, apartment complexes, there are signs all over the place saying uh, nobody with a temperature above whatever it is and no foreigners allowed. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's a, it reminds me of that, uh, that Bruce Lee movie, The Chinese Connection, where, which takes place in Shanghai also. Where Bruce Lee's walking through the park and the security guards point to the sign which says no dogs and no Chinese allowed and he jumps up and jump kicks the sign and breaks it in half and when this played in, in Hong Kong everybody in the theater stood up and gave it a standing ovation they were like yeah down with racism basically <laughs> except now again the tables are turned and they're like yeah you know, I got weird stares before going outside but it was more like curiosity like oh look that's a foreigner neat and now I get like <laughs> mad dog stares like there's a foreigner it's one of them oh, don't let him breathe on you <laughs> basically and I'm like I've been here this whole time I did I've been in Shanghai this whole time during this whole quarantine I did the quarantine just like you and again they're looking at me like ah oh, you're one of them this is all your fault get him <laughs> except don't cuz he'll breathe on you then you'll get sick so how did foreigners at least I got leave? that going for me how how uh, are they, they you know cuz it was like literally completely locked down, right? No, no, not initially. Oh. Well, some cities were locked down. Like Wuhan was locked down. It just recently became unlocked, if you will. Um, but that, that was locked. Like no, after, I've got to be careful how I word this because um, people knew about the virus before Chinese New Year. Mm. And like five million people left Wuhan because there's this mass exodus in like every city in China because everybody gets like this long extended vacation for Chinese New Year. So they travel, they go places. A lot of people go home because they're like migrant workers. So they go home to see their families during the Chinese New Year and they travel. So like a, just a bazillion people travel all over the country, all over the world for vacations, for personal reasons. And it is the worst possible time to have a viral outbreak. 
And that's exactly when it happened. So like 5 million people leave Wuhan, start spreading this virus all over the world, including Iceland, man, Iceland's locked oh, down. Wow. <laughs> Iceland of all places, yeah. the most isolated island up in the Arctic region of this planet is locked down because of this. And yeah, man. So when the news came out, the U.S. Um, consulate uh, mandated that all of the consulate families get uh, withdrawn from China. And I, I have a lot of friends who work for the U.S. consulate, um, a lot of friends who work for the U.S. government, and they, they were all evacuated, like, immediately. And a lot of them were being sent back up until, I think it was just, like, yesterday or the day before, there was this mandate saying, um, today's the cutoff date. If you're a foreigner and you're not already here, you can't get back in. Okay. So foreigners can't get back into China right now. Yeah. Like even if they have a valid visa, even if all their paperwork is stamped and everything, they can't mm. get back in. So basically I can't get in or out at this moment if I even if I wanted to. Um a lot of people when I do videos they they're always like blink twice if you're trapped. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, cuz they always think like the Chinese government's looking yeah. over my shoulder trying to get me monitoring every word and no, nah, man, nah, nothing like that. But, um, yeah, traveling is closed, man. China is closed in that sense. But a lot of countries are. They're following that route. What's his name? Conor McGregor, he did this impassioned speech on Instagram, got millions and millions of views, basically crying out to the government of Ireland, close Ireland. <laughs> it's the only way. We have advanced information. Close Ireland. Don't let it in. So... Yeah, did you hear about, uh, I think Khabib uh, at his American Kickboxing Academy, now they're like, nobody else is allowed in, it's only Khabib until the fight, we don't want him getting sick, and he's there with his mask, it's crazy, he's super careful, I hope it happens. Oh <laughs> man, makes sense, makes sense, man, the UFC just put out um, this video detailing the history of how this fight almost happened so many times and then didn't, <laughs> now it's happening again, it's... It's it's comical, man. It's comical. You can't you can't make this up. It's like the yeah. fight that's cursed and never happened, but it makes sense though. I mean, it's the fight everyone wants to see. It's a, it's going to make so much money for the powers that be in the UFC. And uh, man, the audience is they're going to love it. It's going to answer so many questions if yeah. if it happens. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's in their best interest. It is in their best interest to yeah, don't let anybody in. Lock down that gym. Just focus on Khabib. Keep him healthy. There's, I don't blame them one bit for that decision. There's this one meme, and it's uh, both Khabib and uh, Tony, except they have like white hair, and uh, it's like, like their <laughs> seventh, their seventh time. This time it didn't get canceled. This is the fifth time right here. If it doesn't get canceled, then we're good. They're like senior citizens or something. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So. Oh man, they'll be hobbling into the octagon with canes. Cane fight. <laughs> That's yeah, WWE at this point. <laughs> that's, that, that's an old French martial art, actually. Uh, cane fighting. It was like um, an extension of savat, like the armed savat system. What, mm. what was it called? Like Lacan, like the, the cane fighting system. Okay. I don't know if it's still taught today, but fun little tidbit of historical martial arts information for you. I haven't heard of that. There's one uh, where like people will wrap their uh, their hands in like shoelaces, and it's like called a spear or something. That's crazy. And I think they, like, dip it in, like, glass, yeah. too. Oh, my God. No way. <laughs> like the movie Kickboxer? I haven't seen it. I'm Jean-Claude Van Damme. Oh, is he in Oh, man, movie? Mark, so many movies you got to see. Oh, yeah, I'm terrible. Yeah, Jean-Claude Van Damme. <laughs> there, there was a remake. There was a remake, and Van Damme plays a part in it, but um, the original Kickboxer from the early 90s mm -hmm. with Jean-Claude Van Damme, and uh, he fights this giant Thai boxer named Tong Po who has the super long ponytail I've never seen a dude from Thailand that big mm. but you know it's a movie so yeah. yeah anyway and he goes to Thailand learns Muay Thai and then doesn't do any Muay Thai in the actual fight it's all helicopter kicks and jumping splits and stuff wait is this the, like, the <laughs> you know it's a Jean-Claude Van Damme movie? movie I think it, it was one of them I don't know if it was the first, but it was it was like the first big one, the first one people really paid attention to. I think it came I out of Hollywood. Know what you're talking about? That's like what made people like like start looking at Muay Thai like as a like a legitimate martial art, right? 
Yeah, made a lot of people look at Muay Thai. Okay. But, you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme's old movies, I mean, he, he featured Muay Thai prominently on a lot of them, like Kickboxer, uh, Bloodsport had some Muay Thai fights in there, uh, The Quest, that was, that was, was a big uh, kind of infomercial for Muay Thai, if mm-hmm. you will. But yeah, weirdly, Jean-Claude Van Damme, this karate guy who, you know, doesn't necessarily even have a Muay Thai background, did more for promoting Muay Thai (laughs) in the United States than almost anybody, which is just crazy to think about. Thankfully, though, it's a great martial art. And damn, man. So back to the... Yeah, but there's a scene uh, in the movie, they wrap up their hands with ropes, dip it in glue and then glass and then punch each other and... That is exactly what I was thinking of. What's that? Do you know what the martial art is called? Where they uh, do all that? You know, there there are a few different martial arts where the hands are wrapped in in ropes or or in uh, leather straps. There's an African martial art. What's it called? That's the one I was. uh, Starts with a D, I think. Dumbe. Uh, Yeah, they take their their dominant hand, usually the right hand, wrap it up with ropes until it's a big old ball. And their other hand is free. So mm. one hand wrapped up, one hand free. It's like the shield hand and the weapon hand. Yeah, they call it the spear, and they'll just... Oh, that's terrible. It's... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dembe, I think it's called, something like that. It sounds right, yeah. I'm My terrible. pronunciation of whatever that language is is non-existent, so... So back to the... Uh, yeah, but they're... The, um, I, it, it sucks, because there's like a delay, so we both start talking at the same time. You can... Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, what were you saying? But but there were a bunch of martial arts like that, like um, the ancient Greek Olympics, boxing. Generally, the Olympics in were um, in ancient Greece were in the nude, but they would make an exception for boxing because they would wrap their whole arms, not just the fists, but the whole arms in leather straps with metal studs in them. Mm. And they would generally fight to the death or submission. You'd submit by raising one finger like this. And if there was no knockout, no death, or no submission... Uh, there were no time limits, but if the judges decided this is going on too long, this is boring, they would stop the fight, they would have both fighters stand next to each other, and they would call it the sudden death round. That's where the term sudden death comes from in English, mm. except they meant literal death. Jesus Christ. They would have the, each fighter take turns throwing undefended punches at each other. Hands down, one guy, you know, like those Russian slap boxing mm. contests where they take turns slapping each other, except they would punch, you know, with these these leather-wrapped, metal-studded fists, basically a, a Greek version of the Roman kestus, mm. you know, uh, like brass knuckles, basically. And they would just slug each other until one of them fell down or died. And the guy who was determined to be the better fighter got the first punch. Oh, really? So, yeah, the rules of boxing, <laughs> oh, wow. they have changed a lot, man. They have the changed a lot. The better fighter with the first punch, that sounds very, <laughs> very skewed. <laughs> Yeah, man. I imagine what what it must have been like back then. The fighters were were like, no, the judges robbed him, man. It was the other guy. <laughs> the other guy is dead now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and they, they didn't even get paid, man. They got a laurel wreath, like a ro- uh, crown of leaves uh, that they would wear on their head when they won. And then they would go home, be celebrated as like the hometown hero. And I don't know, get all the girls or whatever it was they did. <laughs> But they didn't get paid for it. It was just for honor, glory, pride, whatever they did it for. But that was a big thing, like a really big thing back then, too. That's like like your family, your your own honor. I feel like, I don't know how old this martial art was, but I feel like that stuff was just very important back in the day. But I don't think fighting to the death is, uh, is losing your life is more important than that. So. Yeah, it's... It's ritual combat is fascinating for a lot of reasons, and combat sports are ritual combat. We we don't often think of it because, you know, it's a sport, it's for fun, it's for ent- entertainment and all that. But at the same time, uh, it serves the same function as the ritual combat of the ancient Olympics or the gladiatorial contests or, or um, man, that weird game the Aztecs used to play where they'd have two teams, so it's kind of like basketball, they would have a rubber ball, throw it through a hole, kind of the equivalent of a hoop, and the losing team would have their heads chopped off. Oh my god. <laughs> a little more severe consequences than modern day basketball. But um, ritualized combat, ritualized sacrifice like that, it's, uh, it serves a very base function, a very base human need to um, have a vicarious experience 
for the audience. Mm. And it's it's something I don't think I don't think you can really understand until you've stepped in a ring or in a cage and you hear what the audience is saying to the fighters. If I was in there, I'd punch him in the face. If I was in there, I wouldn't just hug him, I'd kick him in the head and kill him. And they're expressing these these are otherwise very intelligent people, but you know they get drunk or whatever, and and uh, they let their base desires come out, and they they try to live vicariously through these fighters. And anytime people talk about a fight, like who do you have in the Khabib versus Tony Ferguson fight, and they'll get really impassioned about it because if if I like Tony and you like Khabib, and we start arguing about that, what are we doing? We're vicariously fighting through them. Yeah, they're like our Olympic champions. They are our gladiators, if you will, representing us. So, again, it, it fulfills a need. Mm. And the weird thing is, we're not the only animals that do ritual combat. Oh, absolutely Like a not. lot of animals do it. Mm. Usually for like mating rights or dominance or, or um, territory. Like a lot of lizards wrestle. They don't mm. try to kill each other. They don't try to hurt each other. But they wrestle for territory. It's kind of funny. Like the monitors, the big ones, they do like Greco-Roman style wrestling. All upper body throws. And then the little ones, like skinks and stuff, they do more like freestyle. They grab the legs. They, <laughs> it's very much like freestyle wrestling. They grab the legs, try to trip the other guy over, throw him from the legs, from the tail. I'm going to have to find a video now. <laughs> I'm a nerd. I, I love watching animal fights, yeah. man. I love watching animal fights. <laughs> That's so funny. I haven't seen it's that. not animal cruelty if they start the fights themselves. <laughs> yeah, they're doing it willingly. <laughs> Yeah, but it's it's ritual combat. It, it serves a need that they have in their culture, I guess, if we want to call lizards, lizard society a culture. They interact with each other. They fight, but not to the death. It's like, it's to the death, but nobody has to die. Yeah, kind of like jujitsu, yeah. you know? Exactly. Jiu-jitsu, you, yeah, you simulate death, right? You, you try to strangle that other person, but then nobody has to die because you yeah. tap out and that's it. You know you would have died, but you didn't die, which is a cool part. So, <laughs> Yeah, it's like, you know, it's kind of like a video game, a simulation where you have the chance to do this crazy stuff that would totally get you killed and then try it again and again and again as many times as it takes until you get it right. Mm. Yeah. It's so, like yeah. having the option of being a quantum immortal, if you will. <laughs> You're familiar with that term? Quantum Sorry if I'm immortal. waxing too. No, no, I don't. Uh... Quantum, oh man. Quantum immortality, it's, it's something I was reading up about. I thought, man, this would make a great science fiction novel. Mm. So it's the idea that, um, the idea that in an infinite universe, there's an infinite number of possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's the possibility that everything that can happen has happened or will happen an infinite number of times. And so there, there's this idea, there's a parallel universe where, say, um, everything is exactly the same, except I'm on that side of the camera and you're on this side of the camera. Mm. Or there's a parallel universe where this morning you ate something else for breakfast. Or a parallel universe where dinosaurs are still roaming the earth because they never died out or something like that. Right? Just things are different. Mm -hmm. Quantum immor immortality, here's where that comes in. It's the idea that... The consciousness is not actually held in our brains or in our bodies, but the idea that our consciousness could essentially leap from one iteration of ourselves to another across the multiverse. Uh. And so if, if you die, you don't really die. Your consciousness just jumps into another iteration of you. Now, I know it sounds crazy, and it is, mm -hmm. which, would, which is why it would make a great science fiction novel. So, science fiction writers, there you go. There's your inspiration. Quantum immortality. What got me started on that? I don't even remember. Anyway. <laughs> I do the same thing. I'll go down some rabbit holes. I don't know how I got in. <laughs> I remember I was starting to make a point with that. It was like, I've got a point. It's a really smart point. It's going to sound amazing. And then it's it gone. It's related. Gone. The uh, story went too long. Yes. Oh, yes. Jiu-jitsu related. Yes, exactly. You're right. Thank you. So jujitsu is like attaining quantum immortality because you, you roll until you die, but then you don't die. You, your consciousness leaps into an alternate reality where you didn't get choked to death, mm. and instead you learn from it, and you become a better grappler. 
and then ultimately, you know, you become a great grappler. That's yeah. It's like I, having extra <laughs> lives, man. It's it's amazing. Yeah, but then when we have this whole quarantine, oh, it makes me, oh, I feel so bad. I just want to train. I used to train like six days a week, then suddenly it's zero. It's like I'm dying. <laughs> yeah, man. These are these are trying times. Yeah. Trying times. Like everybody is making, everybody in the fitness industry on social media is making at-home workouts. Like here's a, here's an at-home workout. They're all saying the same thing. Like no gym, no problem. No equipment, no problem. It's a problem. Mm. Let's be honest. It's a problem. Because so many of us are dependent on our schedules to get stuff done. We need consistency. We are creatures of habit. And so there is a time we have appointed to go to the gym, to work out, to meet with the people that we train with and so on. And when we don't have that, we're all left up to our own devices. And we need to reprogram and reschedule in order to get stuff done. That's why I say... Even more important than, you know, looking up at-home workouts on Instagram or whatever it is, get a notebook, write yourself a program. Mm. Like, maybe watch one of those videos and say, I'm going to do this at this time, on this day, um, and I'm going to repeat this workout this day and this day and this day and this day and this day. And write it down and put your goals where you can see them. Because if you don't do that or some equivalent of that... You're going to have this neat idea up here, and it's going to be it's forgotten happen, when yeah. stuff and things happen the next day. Yeah. I actually made a video so, about this uh, recently. So I think it's more, I think it's uh, way more than just like going to the gym itself because the gym owners themselves, they need to like sustain the business. And it, it's a business, like, long story short. If people start canceling their memberships because yeah. they, can't, they can't go or whatever, then it's just not going to be able to, it might not be there when you come back. So I think if you can afford it, I think it's very important to just pay your gym and just support it while you can. So when you come back, you still have that gym to go to. I think that's very, very important. I think it's being overlooked a lot. Yeah, man, that that would be amazing if that happened here in Shanghai. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, I I hear you though, I hear you. I've seen a few prominent figures in the jiu-jitsu community say something along those lines and yeah i absolutely agree with them because man this this quarantine is going to change the world for the better or for the worse in the short run definitely for the worse Mm. it is a massive blow to the economy it is a massive blow to to people's personal finances and those gym owners man owning a gym running a gym it's a labor of love for a lot of these guys Mm. a lot of these guys are making close to zero profits they're doing it because they love to do it. They're doing it because they're trying to lift up their students. They're trying to build up their team, trying to give them a positive experience. They're doing it because they love it. Mm-hmm. If you want to make money and you do something else, yeah, I don't know, you go into investment banking or something like that, some lucrative career, not running a uh, MMA gym. Mm-hmm. So, man, if you if you love MMA, if you love jiu-jitsu, if you love your martial art, yeah, show your martial arts gym some love, man. You know, however that is financially or whatever other help they need to stay open. Otherwise, they might might not be able to. Exactly, exactly. So who do you have for the uh, the Khabib and Tony fight? We were just talking about this earlier. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's let's move on to the serious subject here. <laughs> this is a serious subject. Yeah. I've given this a lot of thought. I get asked this question a bunch of times. And my gut says Khabib. But my mind keeps saying, but what if Tony does this? Mm. What if Tony does that? Because Tony does these things Very strange. that I haven't yeah. seen Khabib. Yeah, he, he puts people in situations I haven't seen Khabib in. Mm. And maybe that means Khabib won't end up in those situations. And maybe it means he will and he won't know how to respond to them. Or maybe he does. It's difficult to say. I, I watched the, watched the, um, you know, the, the weigh-ins, the face-off, where they're saying the angry yeah. words to each other and... <laughs> And Tony's trying to exude confidence, trying to intimidate Khabib, Mm. trying to say, essentially, your conditioning sucks and whatever. And uh, I got to wonder, man, I got to wonder how much of that is lost in translation. How much of that is lost in translation? Mm. Because I've I've lived in foreign countries on a number of occasions. I lived in Argentina, spent some time in Mexico. I've I've lived in, in China. I've lived here for 11 years. 
And even when I understand what people are saying, if they say something derogatory, it's like, this might sound mean, but it doesn't even seem like a real language sometimes when yeah. they're saying angry things. It's like, those aren't curse words. I know what curse words are. Those are fun <laughs> little cute sounds. Yeah. <laughs> like the first time somebody swore at me in Spanish and they're trying to make me mad. And, and I was like, I'm not going to repeat Spanish curse words right here for the sake of all the, all the Spanish viewers, but um, it just didn't sound mean to me. Like, you know, the F word sounds abrasive in English because, you know, we hear it in the context of anger and all of this. And somebody says a word in a foreign language. It's like, no, nah, yeah, it exactly. just doesn't have the same effect. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, man. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm looking at the face of Khabib and, you know, he's, he's smiling and it's not like I'm trying to be cute smile. It's just like, it's just like uh, the type of expression I gave to that guy who's swearing at me in Spanish. And I'm like, this these don't even sound like swear words. Like, I can't take you seriously. Yeah. Yeah, he got pissed, so, too. Yeah. Uh, he was like, uh, Tony was like, I'll beat you in a street fight or whatever. And uh, Khabib was like, you have never been in street fight. I am from Mountain. I'll eat you in street <laughs> fight. So I was like, oh, God. <laughs> oh, man. He is from a different part of the world. I yeah. I have trained with a lot of guys from that that those uh, former Soviet countries ending in Stan, not Dagestan. Mm -hmm. I, I have yet to meet anyone from Dagestan, but like everywhere else, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, um, what's, uh, I'm blanking all the Stan countries. There are so many of them, but almost every other former Soviet country, Kazakhstan, man, there are so many tough guys from Kazakhstan. Oh man, I had a student from Kazakhstan. This guy was, was just beastly good. And, uh, yeah, it's it's just normal in those countries for men to fight, to know how to fight. Like, if you don't know how to fight, that's not normal. It's it's weird. Mm -hmm. There are, like, public boxing gyms, public sambo gyms, public wrestling gyms that you just go to for fun. I had this student from Russia, and he was a pretty good fighter, and and he grew up during the Cold War era. I grew up during the... I grew up during the Cold War era, the end of it in my childhood. And we were comparing notes like, what was your like end of the Cold War experience like? And I was like, you know, well, there was some like mildly anti-Russian propaganda going around when I was a kid. And then it sort of died out. And he was like, when I was a child, we had no toys. We had no games. And so for fun, my friends and I would fight each other. <laughs> my God. I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was about it, man. <laughs> for fun, we would fight. <laughs> how uh, how long were you in China for? I'm guessing you you said you lived in America first before you moved to China. Or yeah, I was I was born and raised in the U.S. Uh, man, funny story, man. I'm so I was born and raised in the U.S. I'm a U.S. U.K. dual national. My family is from England, but I was born and raised in the U.S. I moved to China 11 years ago. Um, I've, I've moved around the world a number of times. I, I lived in Argentina for a couple of years. Like I mentioned, I spent some time in Mexico uh, studying um, for university. Um, I've traveled all over all over Asia. I've been to Thailand, Korea, uh, where else? Malaysia. Um, what's I've been almost everywhere except Japan and uh, North Korea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they don't let people in there. <laughs> North Korea is always closed, man. It's always closed. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder what the virus situation is there. I, I really do. There was, uh, I think, somebody. For, I think it was BuzzFeed. Somebody went to uh, to North Korea and they started recording stuff. It's on YouTube, actually. It's very interesting. Uh, yeah. I don't know how. Oh man, that's how, a dangerous yeah. move. I don't know how they did that, but I mean, how they got out. Yeah, how they got in too. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. That is a uh, that is a risky move, man, for a BuzzFeed video. <sighs> man, I heard there was a case. What was it? Some reporters like crossed the border, just like crossed the border accidentally, I believe, and they ended up stuck there for for some indeterminate amount of time. And the president of the United States had to come and like lobby to get them out, or Jesus. some nonsense like that. Do you know? If yeah, the, it was a big deal. Do you know if the president has ever, probably not, right? Has ever been to North Korea? I would imagine no. Probably a dumb question, but very curious. I, I don't know. To my knowledge, no. But uh, you never know, man. You yeah. never know what the, 
what the heads of state are doing behind closed doors that they're not showing on the TV. Who knows? Yeah. Who knows? Maybe maybe they all get together and play poker in their spare time. Who knows? Yeah. That's what's happening in my conspiracy theory mind here. <laughs> Yeah, I've been having. A They're lot all of... best bros behind closed doors. <laughs> oh, I wish <laughs> that would have had a lot of solutions. <laughs> yeah, if only, yeah. if only. So, uh, before we uh, we end the uh, the podcast, I had a couple of questions just for the uh, viewers. So, I'm sure a lot sure. of people are already struggling with this whole thing, and people have already heard us talking about how you need to like plan if you want to work out at home you can't just say you're going to do this you need to like plan it and schedule it into your day yeah uh how else would you recommend for somebody who can't access the gym uh to improve in martial arts like for example jujitsu it's hard to like replicate the one-on-one uh training what would you recommend yeah oh man it is i would recommend especially if you don't have another human there to do jujitsu with and a big wide open space uh make yourself a grappling dummy they're a lot easier to make than you think. Um, I put up an Instagram video a while back just recently about uh, how, a grappling dummy I made with a sweatshirt. You just stuff mm. a hooded sweatshirt with some blankets or some clothes, tie it off with a shoelace, tie off the neck with, uh, with the drawstrings, and then you have an upper body grappling dummy to rep out arm bars and all this stuff. So if you're worried about losing your jiu-jitsu, rep out hundreds of reps of just the basics. Mm. Just the basics. Man, the amount you can improve in jiu-jitsu just by repping out high volumes of basic movements is unbelievable. Like, people don't believe me when I say this, but repping out basics is huge. Like, as far as boxing goes, if you shadow box, man, I can always tell the difference between people who shadow box and people who don't. Because the ones who do, the ones who take my advice, shadow box three rounds a day in your own time when nobody's making you do it, when it's just you and your own initiative. Mm. They get sharper, they get crisper, they get cleaner, right? And it's the same thing with the jiu-jitsu. Do some shadow wrestling with a dummy. Rep out uh, 100 arm bars from the top, 100 arm bars from the bottom, 100 different transitions on top, something like that. Mm. And do that every day. And then after this three-month quarantine, when you go back to the gym, or however long it is, hope, hopefully not that long for you, let's, let's hope it's less. Mm -hmm. But conservative estimate three months right after three months you go back to the gym a bunch of these guys are going to be complaining about oh i'm so fat no ha 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 because you know no gym yeah. and you're going to be schooling them yeah. why because you know how to move it's ingrained in your muscle memory you're going to be hitting arm bars reverse arm bars all this other stuff so grappling dummies are hugely valuable mm. thing i did when i set up my first home gym back up in the back in the united states because I was I was taking jujitsu lessons, and my coach showed me like here's an armbar, here's a reverse armbar, here's a triangle choke, here's all this stuff, and I was like, okay, this is good. I'm getting some reps in this class, but I'm not getting enough reps to remember it. How am I going to do this? And so I just had this idea. I designed a grappling dummy. It was a pretty complicated one. I used PVC pipes and oh, yeah. did a lot of sewing and stuffed it and. And gave it reapable joints because <laughs> it was cool, man. It was cool because you could like pop the elbows and uh, pop them back yeah. into place. So it felt like actually breaking an arm. But you don't need something that complicated, like even a hooded sweatshirt, mm -hmm. right? Or if you want to do leg stuff, you know, put some sweatpants on there, stuff your gi, anything like that, mm -hmm. right? Anything with arms and legs. Keep it that simple, right? You, when I started repping out those numbers, suddenly, when I started going live, I started catching people with submissions for the first time in my life. It was a miraculous moment. A lot of white belts, they go into the gym, they learn these moves, and they're like, yeah, yeah, that works for him because he's the coach. He's a black belt. Not for me. I'm just a normal guy. That'll never happen. They tell themselves this in their minds. Mm -hmm. But I can promise you, if you rep out hundreds of repetitions on a grappling dummy like that, you know what, you don't have to be faster, physically faster than the other guy because you're already going to be faster at solving the problem. Mm. Which is an issue that comes up, yeah, it comes up in martial arts all the time. People always talk about speed, speed. There's a limit to human speed, which is something around 20 miles per hour. That's as fast as the fastest humans can move in any way, in any measurable way. So there's a limit to speed. But fights are not based on speed, it's based on the speed at which you solve the problem. Who solves the problem first? 
And when you've already solved the problem thousands of times by yourself without anybody pushing you, making you do it, mm. when it comes time to solve that problem on the mat, you get there first. So that's my advice. Make yourself a grappling dummy. Use it. It's a very good mindset. And I, I didn't even think about making one, to be honest. I was looking online, and they're, yeah. they're fairly expensive. So I was like, I guess I can't. Yeah, get there are dummy. some expensive ones. Some <laughs> of them are pretty good. Some of them are not but man, stuff a sweatshirt, a hooded sweatshirt, you can choke it, you can arm drag it, you can do all kinds of stuff. And again, if you want to do the lower body, you know, just stick some pants on there. Yeah. Strap it together with something, shoelaces or whatever you have. I'm going to have to get Be one creative. of those one-piece pajamas. <laughs> stuff one of those. Yeah. <laughs> get some one-piece pajamas, get a, get a unitard, whatever, a wrestling singlet, I don't know, something to hold it all, yeah. all together. All right, Some is, giant uh, rubber bands. <laughs> is there anything uh, that you wanted to talk about before we do end it off? Anything in mind? Oh, man. I'm I'm just worry, worrying about my catchphrase, man. Get out there and train. <laughs> because there I think people train, are guys. taking it the wrong way. Because there isn't just like there at the gym or there outside. There is wherever you are. Oh, yeah. Like at your own home. That's there. right? In your living room. That's there. You know, in your yard, wherever it is you exercise, wherever it is you train, that is there. So get out yeah. there and train. When Ramsey says get out there and train, he doesn't mean go out and be in a group of like 100 people when there's a virus going around. He means be safe when you train. <laughs> exactly. I appreciate that interpretation, my friend. I appreciate you coming on, man. Uh, like I said, it was a great time uh, talking to you last time. This one was just as good, so... I'm grateful for having you on. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, man.